Good afternoon. I don't know about you guys, but it's been a long day. Um, <laughs> but I'm excited to share a little bit about my proposed research with y'all. Um, so I uh, work on several islands uh, along the Georgia coast, and I'm really interested in how land use history has affected the forests that we see on these islands today, and how that history might interact with other sources of stress to influence the way these forests change in the future. So I was trying to think of kind of the perfect opening image for this presentation and late one night this painting by Philip Drass popped into my head and I knew that this was it. Um, his artwork really manages to capture the beauty and the magic of this landscape in a way that leaves a lot of us who work down there um, really breathless. But there was another reason that I chose this image and that's because it shows a cedar tree growing out of a shell midden which is essentially a Native American trash pile. So people have been living on this landscape for a really long time and everything they have done, whether it was creating trash piles like this one that are 4,000 years old or African-American slaves who are growing um, cotton and rice on these islands, all of those things have had an influence on the plant communities there. And I've become really, really interested in those, um, those long-term persistent legacy effects. So, like um, perhaps some of y'all's research project, uh, this specific project began at a cocktail party <laughs> when, uh, when I saw this map. I was on St. Catharines working as an archaeologist and was having dinner at the superintendent's house and um, this was above the bar. This is a, a 1867 map of St. Catharines and it's showing the distribution of fields across the islands and I was immediately just captivated by this and I started, I stared at it for probably 30 minutes and imagined places that I knew around the island and different types of forests and um, the, ne the, ne the next morning, um, the first thing I did was actually go on Google Earth and I pulled up this image of the island on the left here. This is from 2008 and it's not showing super clearly right now, but you can still see the outlines of some of these fields um, and some of them were abandoned 150 years ago. So I, um, I, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew it, it had to have something to do with these legacy effects, so my advisor was lovely enough to let me spend a summer wandering around the forest um, doing important survey work, and I discovered, well, I didn't discover it, I discovered it for myself um, during the summer, that there was really this lack of regeneration of live oaks across the island. Um, I had had the island, the island manager had told me about, about this before, but I really spent the summer hunting for a live oak tree my size and I didn't find one. I found a lot of seedlings, but um, most of them were very heavily browsed and were very small. So um, I started asking questions and really diving into uh, potential causes of this problem. And of course, I heard a lot about herbivory from deer and pigs. Um, my mind immediately went to legacy effects. Perhaps this lack of regeneration has something to do with the land use history. And then of course undercurrent running in the back of my mind is also climate change. So at this point um, I had a problem and I had some potential uh, causes and so that means that it's time to write a grant application. So my advisor and I um, applied for a coastal incentive grant to work on four islands along the Georgia coast and we really framed it in terms of these multiple stressors and again our overarching question and interest is in how these stressors are influencing live oak regeneration and what that means for the future of these forests. So before I go into the meat and potatoes of the ecological questions that I'm asking, there's another aspect of this project that I want to talk about. It's kind of the icon -y part of it. Um, so even before we submitted the application, while we were still working on it, we spent a lot of time with the island managers. And we did these walking interviews where we essentially went out into the forest with them and their staff and listened to them talk about the forest. And, the, um, the drivers of ecological change that they saw and learned a lot about the history of very specific places on these islands as well. Um, we got access to some really amazing unpublished, undigitized maps and surveys. And we had such an overwhelming um, kind of amount of interest and support from these managers that we decided to host a maritime forest research workshop, which is coming up 
way too quickly. <laughs> um, and we're going to be sitting down with land managers and other stakeholders and researchers from the coast and really trying to identify key research priorities, knowledge gaps, and conservation goals. And then um, after that workshop, I'm going to be um, continuing these walking interviews and doing semi-structured interviews with these land managers. And my goal is to really understand the cultural and mental models they use to uh, make their management decisions. So how are they obtaining knowledge? Who are they talking to? Are they going into the literature? Are they you know, using their own long-term and, and astute observations? Um, and then how are they using that information to make management decisions? So for instance, um, I'd be interested in how they think about a fire moving through a forest like this. And uh, how did they come to that knowledge and, and how does it actually influence their fire management strategy? All right. Um, to dive into the ecology, uh, how am I even going to begin to <laughs> answer this question, what is the future of these forests? Um, well, I'm going to briefly explain my overall research design because these questions are, are pretty tightly interwoven with one another, but step one is to build fences on these islands. We know herbivory is a problem, so I'm going to be putting up deer and hog fences um, in different areas across these islands with different land use histories. Um, and then I'm going to be planting live oak and sand live oak seedlings. They're two sister species that I'll talk more about in a second um, within those plots and then actually imposing water stress on them and droughting them. So that's kind of the broad outline. Um, now I'm going to go through each one of these components uh, kind of one by one. So um, in terms of herbivory, my actual research question is fairly simple. Um, what is the effect of deer and hogs on live, on live oak and sand live oak uh, survival and growth. So we have uh, short fences for hogs, tall ones for deer. Um, one important thing we're going to pay attention to is whether or not we have just spontaneous regeneration of live oaks inside these fences. If all you have to do is put up a fence, are you going to get some regeneration? Um, I'm going to start you off really easy <laughs> with this graph of my expected results. Um, I think seedlings will do better when you put a fence around them. Um, and I think deer are having the, the most negative effect on growth and survival than hogs, and, um, and then I expect uh, no fencing to have the, the lowest rates of growth and survival. All right, to make it a little more complicated, again, these fences are going in forested areas across these islands that have different land use history that were either cultivated around the time of the Civil War, um, probably in cotton, or, uh, or uncultivated. We, don't, we have no reason to think there was a, um, a historic period of cultivation. And I have kind of two main questions. The first one is, is fairly simple. What is the effect of land use history on oak seedling survival and growth? So is there something about uh, these areas in terms of um, changed properties, uh, soil nutrients, that kind of thing that might affect uh, oak seedlings? The second one is a little more complicated. I'm interested in if drought and land use history are actually um, interacting to potentially influence oak seedling survival and growth. And this question really um, is born of an idea called the rise of the mediocre forest. And this suggests that chronically stressed trees might actually be better able to withstand periods of episodic stress better than their healthier counterparts. So I'm suggesting that this history of cultivation is actually imposing a chronic stress on these seedlings. And you know, maybe they develop deeper root systems, maybe they have a different um, leaf to shoot ratio. And that actually makes them a little hardier and tougher and better able to withstand a drought. So drought. I'm going to give you the 60 second version of what happens to a plant when it undergoes water stress. Um, you can think of plants like straws. They suck up water through their roots. It travels up through the xylem in their stem and then it evaporates out of the leaves. So when um, a plant is experiencing water stress, that water column that's moving within its stem actually comes under greater and greater tension and, and the pressure inside the stem becomes more negative. And if that tension becomes too great, an air pocket can actually kind of slip into that xylem vessel. And in effect, this, this process is called embolization, and in effect, that little air bubble will block the flow of water through the stem in that vessel. So as water stress continues, more and more of these vessels become embolized, and the plant essentially loses hydraulic function. It loses the ability to transport water through its stem. Um, so this is fairly easy 
to measure. Uh, you can just cut out a chunk of stem, attach some hoses to either end, force water through, and then measure that rate of conductance. And that will give you an idea of how many vessels are embolized. Um, and this allows you to create what's called a vulnerability curve. I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. But it basically, you can chart um, how a plant loses hydraulic function over a period of time as, as water stress continues. So I've already spoken a little bit about drought and land use history and my questions related to that. I'm also interested in um, root sprouts and acorn seedlings. These are two different types of seedlings. Root sprouts come up from the root. Acorns come from, I call them real seedlings. Um, and they potentially have very different vulnerabilities to drought and this is important for a number of reasons. And then my second question is related to these two sister species, live oak and sand live oaks. We think that sand live oaks are actually going to be better able to withstand drought than live oaks, um, but they fulfill kind of the same ecological function in, in these forests. So we're interested when we think about future climate conditions, if uh, there's a difference in the vulnerability of these two species. So this is just a, a diagram showing the Sperry method. This brown section here would be the stem. You have a mass balance, you're forcing water through and just measuring that rate of conductance. And that's gonna give you this graph, which these graphs are a little funky to interpret. So I'm gonna take just a second to explain it because I'm gonna show you a lot of them. On this side, you have the percent loss of hydraulic conductance. You can think of this as um, hydraulic function. So down here at the bottom, you have full hydraulic function. Up at the top, you have 100% hydraulic failure. On the bottom here, this, this is basically going from very wet, moist, um, to very dry. And this is just that pressure, that tension on the water column within the xylem. So as things become more dry and you get greater and greater tension, uh, the plant will actually begin to uh, approach and, and eventually lose complete hydraulic function. Now, in this example, you can see live oaks um, are actually losing hydraulic function earlier, and they're actually losing it more quickly than sand live oaks. I think. That's what I'm going to be testing. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so um, expected results, and I'm sure my data is going to look exactly like this. Um, Again, I suggest that seedlings in areas with a history of cultivation will be better able to withstand drought than those in forests with no history of cultivation. So um, again, you can see they're losing hydraulic function earlier um, and, and potentially more quickly. In terms of root sprouts uh, and acorn seedlings, I think root sprouts are going to do a lot better under drought conditions than acorn seedlings because they have access to the root system of the entire mature adult tree. And it's possible, <coughs> excuse me, it's possible that they may never even lose um, all of their hydraulic function um, because, of, because of that. <coughs> excuse me. And this last, lastly, this question of, of two species, sand live oaks versus live oaks. Again, this is from the example. I think that live oaks will, um, will lose hydraulic function, be less able to tolerate drought than sand live oaks. And this can have, um, again, important implications under changing climate conditions and potentially inform our conservation slash restoration strategies. So um, a few kind of wrinkles or potential problems with this research. I'm very close to wrapping it up. Um, is there a problem? Uh, are we actually seeing regeneration failure? Uh, live oaks are incredibly long-lived species. It's really hard to understand um, the dynamics of their regeneration and the different methods they have for regenerating. So if we're not seeing continuous recruitment, meaning recruitment every year, that might not actually be a problem for these species, but we just simply don't know. Um, and then lastly, if anyone has any ideas on how to distinguish a root shoot from an acorn without digging it up, then please come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thanks.